This week on CrossFeed. The atheist ads are back. The Holy Land experience. Don't burn a crayon, win a car. Who gets your donations? Recharge your soul and recharge your car. everyone, welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio. Which apparently everybody knows where it exists except FedEx or something like that, near as I can figure out from you. And uh, I'm Pastor Jim Butler out here in beautiful Dedham, Massachusetts. Hey everybody, it's good to be here. Sorry about last week, uh, Dale had a slight modem problem. All right, I was on vacation, all right, for a week. Not going anywhere, just, you know, had a week left and decided just going to relax a little bit before the, you know, all the advent and, and busyness and everything and um, get some stuff done around the house and that and just relax, okay? Then my modem goes out Friday and I didn't get a new one until Wednesday afternoon. Ugh. <laughs> that was really painful. If I didn't have my Blackberry, I'd have been toast. <laughs> You are too wired, buddy. I know. <laughs> I know. I was thinking, well, I am spending more FaceTime with my wife. That's kind of nice, you know. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, I, I spent an entire week out on the ship with no internet. And I didn't miss it. You know, so. Well, you and. know. Honestly, the most frustrating thing was that, um, I mean, I, okay, I, I do a lot of Facebooking, okay? And, um, and, and I have Facebook on my Blackberry. And I would, but the Facebook on my Blackberry for some reason doesn't work very well. And so I would get this, it would notify me that there's a comment to something that I said. But when I click on it, it would, it wouldn't be able to bring it up. And so I'd know that there's people out there that are, you know, commenting and, and, you know, saying things to me, but I don't know what they said. <laughs> Drive me crazy. Like what? What? It's, it's like when you know that somebody's talking about you, but you don't know what they said. <laughs> but, okay. Oh, last class, last time we were together, last class I was teaching. Sorry. Last time we were together, I had said I'd got back from the Bahamas and I mentioned that I got this really cool shirt and somebody said, Oh, I can't wait to see Jim's shirt. So here it is, folks. I'm wearing my shirt from the Bahamas. See, they got all the cool. Stuff. So you see the pink down there. You know, real guys wear pink, and uh, so it's 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 cool shirt. It's it's um. So there you go, fully modeled for you. <laughs> well, we had uh, I had a really cool day today. We had um, this morning we had our service of uh, uh, International Day of Prayer for the persecuted church. Um, we had a, a woman from our congregation from Indonesia uh, talking about. Christianity in Indonesia and, and persecution and things like that. Um, and then we also had, I had a interview clips from an interview, uh, with a pastor down in Columbus, Ohio, that works with Somali Muslims. Um, they are, are building a church. So 17, um, people that have become Christians. And, um, but he talked about the, the danger that, um, that these people face. That like for instance, one guy he has family in um, in Somalia, and if word got if 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 the Muslims here in the United States found out about him becoming a Christian, then they would um, they would contact the people back in Somalia and could hurt or kill his children. And so he has to keep his identity. So we actually, we had a few people, we actually prayed for them, um, in the, in the service, but, and we had their names printed in the bulletin, but didn't say their names out loud since we were streaming it out. And I had to tell everybody, careful what you do with these bulletins and, and stuff. Um, you know, don't let them fall into the wrong hands and that. Cause we didn't have, it was just first names, but still, you know. There was enough information there that, that could have been uh, damaging for them. And, and so um, <clears throat> it was really cool. We had some, if the service is online, if you go to shepherdoftheridge.org, um, you can see the whole thing. Um, the, we had some audio problems 
uh, with with the microphone of the young woman that was talking about Indonesia. So some of that's kind of hard to hear, and and just because of some, um, uh, she's got an accent, and and um, the uh, the pastor uh, that in the interviews has an accent too, and and so it's it's kind of hard to understand some of it, especially you know, through the audio system and everything, um, I'm going to kind of, I'll post my sermon, which has those clips in it. And, uh, I'll make sure that that's sort of, um, understandable, but yeah, it was, it was really cool, um, you know, to have that and, uh, to be able to do that and, and just to, to help people recognize how good we have it here. You know, what well, really might have helped the whole situation. These people got a new car. All right. <laughs> All right. So we talked about it. I mean, I, you just gave just a perfect segue there. There you, you go. Know? Speaking of Muslims. Speaking of Muslims, the Quran and persecution. Yeah, it all kind of fits together. Yep. So we remember good old Terry Jones, this guy um, down there at the Dove World Fellowship Center, which all of what, 100 people, maybe not even that many. Um, <clears throat> who a couple months ago really caused a, a firestorm when he was going to burn the Koran, and he started National Burner Koran Day. Of course, people have been burning Korans before. Nobody's really said anything about it, uh, including on the stu- out in the streets of New York. But, you know, nobody really cared. But for this guy, it got to be a big deal. Well, a car dealer up in New Jersey um said to him, it said, made him an offer. He said, if you do, don't burn the Koran, we, um, uh, Brad Bunsen Hyundai, he said, we'll give you a new Hyundai. I bought a car, turned out to be an alien robot. And he didn't burn the Koran. And so they called up the, the Hyundai dealer and said, hey, can we still get that free car? <laughs> and so he now has a Hyundai accent. You know, the 2011 Hyundai Accent valued around thirteen thousand six hundred dollars. Um, so, but it it said that um, the, the Pastor Jones is going to donate the car to a Muslim charity. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, I, I'm wondering if I was wondering if it was a Muslim charity or a charity that you know maybe. Christian charity that works with Muslims or something like that. You know, I, I could see that. Uh, but I don't think he'd donate to a Muslim charity. Yeah, that seems sort of a, a complete 180, you know. Yeah, and I got to wonder about the whole deal of even asking for the car. I don't, it strikes me, it just strikes me as a little tacky, you know. Yeah. Don't burn the Koran, get a free car. Now, it does say that a representative from his church called them and asked him about it. It doesn't say that he did. Yeah, a representative, but it had to be at his, his his request. You know. Not necessarily. Somebody could have, oh, hey, remember, you know, they came across the thing and said, huh, we should call them, you know. Who knows? Who knows? But, uh, next thing you know, he'll, he'll get a trip to Disney World. Hey, Pastor Jones, you didn't burn a Koran. What are you going to do next? I'm going to Disney World. He's not that far away from it. <laughs> he could drive his new Hyundai down there. Yeah. <laughs> of course, I mean, you know, we, you know, we, we are talking a $13,000 Hyundai. We're not talking, you know, a, you know, ca- a caddy or something. But yeah. still, I don't know, there's something about this that just strikes me as a little bit weird. I don't know. It has me going, gee, what could I do? To... <laughs> you know, it just seems to me this is an example of rewarding bad behavior. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it's, you know, it's not like he, you know, um, you know, didn't, you know, step backed off on this a lot earlier. He had all these condemnations and, you know, now we're finding out he was, you know, basically bribed. Um Man, yeah. You know, I mean, what what happens next? I mean, you know, somebody else going to call the dealership and say, "Hi, I'm going to burn a crayon unless you give me a car." <laughs> <laughs> you know, all of a sudden they're we're holding the Quran hostage. <laughs> what do you think I could get for a Book of Mormon? I got a couple of those know. sitting on my shelf. <laughs> I don't really need them all. You know, just one's enough. 
couple extra wives. I don't know. <laughs> oh, man. There he goes. We just lost our Mormon listeners. <laughs> yeah, like we ever had any of them. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, we know we have a few because they, 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 they send us notes every now and then. But, hey, guys, just pull, just having a little fun, just yep. yanking your chain a little bit. Uh, you know, just, just giving you a good time, rattling your cage. Um, but you know, seriously, um, you know, this strikes me as just, you know, a bad thing of just what's rewarding bad behavior. You know, I mean, maybe, maybe, you know, he is donating to a, a Muslim charity. If he does, maybe to kind of make some amends and say, yeah, you know what? I was a real jerk, but I guess I'd rather have a public apology saying, you know what? I was a real jerk. Mm-hmm. Uh, I may not agree with what Muslims believe, but I definitely went about the wrong way trying to make that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so, you I, know what? Instead of going to Disneyland, though, you know where he could go? Yeah, Holy somewhere Land. Somewhere else, yeah. Somewhere else. No. Okay. So, this is, it's in Orlando, right? Yeah. Um, but. Theme park capital of the world. Yep. The Holy Land experience. All right. Now, some of you are going, that's not news. I have, I've been there, you know. All right. So this is, um. Been there, done that, bought the t-shirt. <laughs> and the snow globe and the, you know. All right. Um, it's, it's 10 years old though. All right. And, and we've never talked about it. And I thought there wasn't a lot of, even though it's been, you know, a few weeks since we've had a show, there wasn't much good news. So I saw this one and I thought, eh, ABC News is doing a little, um, sort of travel guide thing and, so I thought I'd grab it because I thought it would be worth talking about. All right. Um, so it's the Holy Land Experience. It's been around for 10 years. It was started by a Baptist pastor and then somewhere along the line got picked up by uh, Trinity Broadcasting Network. And uh, they really made a cash cow out of it. And um, so it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a theme park. It doesn't have rides. Um, but you can uh, do things like it says... Um, uh, guests are treated to ten daily recreation or recreation, sorry, of the Last Supper, a chance to mingle with Roman soldiers, and every day at noon and again at five p.m., Jesus is shackled in chains and whipped before being dragged bloodily through the streets of Old Jerusalem. That's one for the whole family. So, of course, my question is: Does anybody go up and tell them? Ask the question: What time is the five o'clock crucifixion? <laughs> So, you know, I mean, you know, the guy was telling me, you know, on the cruise ship, he said, they said the question, what time is the midnight buffet? So, you know, you know, <laughs> but, you know, so I don't know. I mean, it's only 15 acres. I mean, this thing's not very big. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just, I don't know. It strikes me as tacky in, in some ways. Dude, there's a spot where you can pose for a photo of you walking on water with Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Like I said, it strikes me a little tacky um, right there. I mean, Christian karaoke, sing for the king. Oh man, that's what I want to take part of. Yeah, I want to. I want to pay, um, uh, what, thirty five dollars a day <laughs> to go listen to karaoke. I could. There's there's places right here in town. Jim, you went to one with me. <laughs> yeah, one of the bullfrog, right? <laughs> For ladies' <laughs> night, there were no <laughs> Josh, they, I still talk about in, that. In theory, they had karaoke, <laughs> yeah, and, and there was no cover charge. <laughs> no cover charge. Food good. Food was good. Yep. <laughs> that heck of a French dip or whatever I had that night, or a Philly steak, cheese steak, whatever it was, it was really good. But anyway, I, I like this as there's a replica um, of the Church Nativity just around the corner from King Solomon's Third Temple. I don't remember him making a third temple, unless they're talking about the Temple of Herod the Great. Uh, yeah, it would have to be. Um, but that's one of the um, performance stages, too. Yeah. See, you know, that's where it, it starts to get, I don't know if that's where it starts to get tacky, but, you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know I, I'm just thinking about, you know, the, the temple is this, does at some point when when somebody's up there doing karaoke, does Jesus come in and <laughs> overturn the tables and kick them out and say, "This is a place of worship, not a den of thieves"? Right. 
Or a spot where kids can walk into a stinky whale's mouth and see a trap Jonah. Oh, man. That's, that's what I want to see. Okay, but each day, guests fill out little slips of paper with various requests for prayers or for salvation. 60,000 to 100,000 a year are completed. Um, they analyzed the requests and found that they fall into four groups. Hope for salvation for loved ones, resolution of financial problems, help with marriage problems, and prayers for well-being for their kids or family. At the end of the day, all the prayers are spread out and everybody joins together and prays for those requests. The slips of paper are also a way for Trinity to add people's addresses to their database. All right. So so you don't just come in and, and enjoy the activities. You you come in at the end of the day, everybody gets together and prays. Oh boy, is this great? Which is not a bad thing. Yeah, that's good. Um, and, and it says the highlight of the visit for many is the scriptorium, a 15-room exhibit that tells the story about how the Bible came into our hands today. The uh, display includes authentic 5th century fragments from the book of Matthew, tributes to those who fought for religious freedom in the past, and a manuscript from the year 350 A.D. Um, and the tour through time culminates in a grand finale where visitors see God turn the Ten Commandments into stone. I was kind of wondering about that one. Um, and then hear a voice from above explain how humans have been unable to follow the laws. This is the only hope for mankind, the voice says, as a giant cross hanging above is illuminated and guests are ushered into another gift shop. <laughs> <laughs> this, okay. Uh, they got, right up to that point, it sounds kind of cool, you know. <laughs> Until like, they're oh, ushered into the gift shop. <laughs> okay, time go go buy a snow globe, this, a water bottle. Bottle. <laughs> this is the only hope for mankind. A snow globe. Oh no no no! I mean the cross. You know, a Holy Land experience umbrella, or um. Bernardo the scribal bear dressed in a monk's outfit and you know my job is to copy the words of the bible into a new fresh piece of parchment only 1499 <laughs> <sighs> yeah let's just I don't know like I said in some ways it sounds kind of cool but in other ways you just gotta have just gotta wonder you know it it's the this is the thing that I always struggle with. Like, okay, you know, my um, my daughter's bedroom has, you know, X-Men posters hanging in it, okay? Because they're my old posters from college. But, um, you know, and I thought about, I, I, I mean, if, if you ever saw a picture of my um, my bedroom in college, it was just the whole wall was, uh, was just wallpapered with comic book posters, all right? And... You, know, you have all these heroes and that, and and you want to you know put up pictures in your room and stuff like that. Okay, so well, okay, your hero is Jesus, and so okay, I want to have you know Jesus posters and and you know and, and stuff like that, um, or you know the apostles or or whatever. Okay, and so but then you know th okay, so you want what about your you know instead of a, a you know what about your lunchbox? Okay, um, or uh, you know, you, you sort of think of all the sort of commercial stuff um, that you can slap a logo on, and you know, okay, we Americans we like that stuff, you know, and so, well, what if I instead of having some sort of fictional character or some sports person or whatever, all right, I want to have, you know, Jesus because. He's my main man, you know. Um, yeah, you know, and and so there's there's sort of that on one side, and then on the other side there's, um, you know, the, um, snow globes. Um, yeah, which I, you know, and, and actually on the other side it's <clears throat> here's a matchbox car, and we'll um, we'll tape a Bible verse to it and charge you three times as much for it. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what you get at Christian bookstores. Yeah, it's <clears throat> well. Somebody once said, you know, the world's a 
Jesus, there's money to be made in Jesus' name. The world's going to make it. Mm-hmm. So, um, my goodness. Um, but you know what I wonder if you could do down there? Can you charge your car? Uh, but not. For that, you have to go to Wooden Cross Lutheran Church in Woodville, Washington, which is like the opposite end of the country. About That's as far true. away as you can get. Right. So this is um I, I've started to hear about these things that they're they're putting up all these um these car charging stations all over the place. It can take I heard it can take up to four hours to charge your car, your electric car, um at one of these stations to a full charge. And um and so um <clears throat> the what this church is doing is they're going to have a charging station at their um, at their church. So you can go to church, and if you drive an electric car, if you if you get that that uh, parking spot, <laughs> you can charge your car while you're at church. Good. You know what? I just want to have a I I just want to have a few of the people who can or, afford the forty one thousand dollar car in my church. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. You think, oh, there's an interesting, you know, perspective. Would it attract those kind of people? You know, oh well, I'll join that church. You know, <clears throat> yeah, I can charge my charge my car. You know, which I bought at the government owned motor company <laughs> with a seven thousand dollar tax credit for buying it because we know everybody wants to tell. Oh, and, and this, by the way, is a fifty. Uh, uh, one third of this, this, no, what is it? It's a $37 million rollout with $15 million coming from the federal government. And, um, then, uh, um, uh, there's another one called, yeah, yeah. And then some other federally funded initiatives to set up the charging stations. So, um, the arrival of mass produced electric cars by automakers such as General Motors and Nissan's elect- all electric leaf. And other cars are supposed to, companies are supposed to start coming up with electric cars, too. But, uh, <clears throat> yes, let's reduce global warming by using more electricity that takes coal to create. But we won't, you know. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was wondering about that same thing. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, folks. I really am. I just, you know. Now, I, okay, because this Wooden Cross Lutheran is saying, you know, it, they want to be more eco-friendly and take conservation ideas in the congregation. They even have a, a green initiative there. Um, you know, I'm sorry. And by the way, the Chevy Volt is nothing more than a, you know, Airzats hybrid, because once you get the car up to going seventy miles an hour, the gas engine takes over anyway, <laughs> and it can only go forty miles on a charge. So, so it's a good commuter, but that's it. <clears throat> well, depending where you live, it ain't going to make you commute. Uh, you can if you can plug it in while you're at work. Yeah, you know, because everybody knows electricity's free. <clears throat> right. <laughs> And all, yeah, all the companies are going to have plug-ins for everybody's car because it literally doesn't cost them any money. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just something I can't figure out for the life of me. I don't, my understanding is that it uses less energy overall. So, <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. But um, I, I know that they get a whole lot more... Um, they're they're cheaper to run overall, but then when you figure in the cost of the vehicle, you kind of have to balance it out. But um, my my question with this is: All right, this reminded me of the churches that have the um, the cell phone towers built into their steeples. And when that started happening, I remember getting a sort of warning from our district that said, "Hey, if you're thinking about doing this, watch it because you could lose your tax exempt status." So, um, so I'm just wondering if they're going to make money off of this, off these charging stations, like a gas station sort of thing, um, are, you know, cause I imagine that you probably just swipe your credit card or something like that through it. Are they getting a cut of this? So if so, how's that going to affect their tax exempt status? So, I don't know. 
I mean, and I imagine you have to be careful how you set that up. You're fooling yourself. Why are living in a dictatorship? Um, I imagine they'll come up with, I'm sure they've got some how to do it. I don't know what difference does it make. Pink, yeah, you know, it's being paid for by government money anyway, so who cares? <laughs> You know, but I, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, are, are they going to have a, a quarter that you use? You know, just get, you know, how much? You know, are they going to have a you know, swipe your card for four hours of charge here? Um, I suppose when you unplug it, that's when you get charged. You know how much? You know, it's like when you go to the gas station, you swipe your card and then you fill up. Yeah, you know, you know, but uh, yeah, I, I kind of like this. Uh, this is the charging equipment developers have talked about how their gear could be used by hotels, malls, and other businesses to draw more foot traffic. Charging a battery fully takes hours. I just don't see people coming in going, "Yeah, I got this thing plugged in the church. I got here for four hours. I think I'll do walk through the church for a while." <laughs> Yeah, I know. well, you know, our service, because of the special service and the speaker and all that kind of stuff, our service ran like an hour and a half this morning. So, hey, if we had these electric chargers in our parking lot, man, we'd just be getting started. Four-hour service. Get comfortable. <laughs> Bring your own seat cushion. <laughs> you might need it. You could serve refreshments. Right. Uh, uh, how many... Them. I mean, how many cars will one of these does the, the state this charging station take? I wonder. Station could take two cars. So wow. I didn't, I didn't see that in the article, but I there was just a thing on the news here um, where they were talking about it. So, um, so yeah, I mean, if they're going to have one charging station there, they can charge two cars at a time. So, um, you know, I imagine that if there was more demand for it, they could probably get some more installed. But it, it, it does seem like on the one hand, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's promoting green technology or whatever. Um, on the other hand, like you have to kind of think about what is the focus of your church? Um, and, and what, what, what is your message? All right. Now, certainly caring for God's creation, you know, is, is part of, of the message, but, is it your main message? Is it, is it like, oh, it, or, or another way to look at it is what is your church known for? That's something I talk about a lot. What is your church known for? Are these guys are even known for, it? oh, that's the church with the electric charging station. All right. And, and I would say if you're going to be known for something, let it be that they teach people about Jesus, you know, or they really love people and, and they, they really are helpful in the community or something like that. Like, I mean, our church is known for our preschool. They've got the best preschool in town. That's what we're known for. Um, and, uh, so, you know, it's, it's folks on, on teaching. And so I, I'm pretty happy with that. And so, you know, this, I don't, maybe in that community, that would be a, a popular thing and, and, and people go, Oh, well, that's the green church. I'm going to go there. Um, but I don't know. It just, it seems like, I guess another way to look at it is, all right. Um, it, it's sort of like preaching politics from the pulpit. If we don't, who else will? All right. And there's all, there's plenty of people out there that'll preach the green gospel, you know? Well, it's the law, but, um, but if, if, you know, if you're not proclaiming Christ, nobody else is going to pick up the ball and run with it for you. And so I, I, you know, again, don't have the whole story. This is just emphasizing this is one thing that they're doing, you know? So, so I don't know. They, they could be, and it's, it's a Lutheran church. I'll bet you it's CLCA, but don't know. It is. For sure. yeah. I looked it up. Okay. I kind of figured, um, that not that, you know, it's not that there's anything wrong with this, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just wondering what else is going on. I got a bad feeling about this. So, right. There's nothing wrong with it. It just sounds a little odd. It really does. And, uh, 
you know, and, and, and I'm sorry, folks, you know, and, and maybe some of you guys can, can correct me. I'm just really skeptical on the idea of um, this, you know, Chevy Volt. Um, you know, not many people can afford a $41,000 car that fits, you know, four people. Um, and, um, you know, um, <clears throat> then I'm just not big on government intervention and, and uh, things anyway. So I'm just sorry. It's just it's just. You see, you know, I remember one time reading that of every dollar that went to the poor and to the government, 80 cents of it got eaten up in administration. So ever since that, I've just always had a real <laughs> suspicion on anything dealing with government. Just a natural thing with me there. Um, oh, well. Maybe they'll make money. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so. That explains this whole what's going on with donations then. All right. Um, this is <clears throat> this is the first I've heard about this organization. Empty I've never tomb. heard of them before. Never this, heard of them before either. So usually you hear like Barna or the um, the Pew uh, research studies. This is Empty Tomb, an Illinois-based Christian research organization. Um, and they did a study. This is from 2007 to 2008, so it's a little old. Um, but Protestant churches saw a decrease of $20.02 in per-member annual charitable gifts. Meanwhile, the um, their analysis of federal data found that the annual average contributions to the category of church religious organizations, which includes charities like World Vision and Salvation Army, increased by $41.59. So, um, they're saying that churches spend more money on congregational finances and less on missions beyond the church walls, which is unappealing to people who want to sp support specific causes with a tangible, visible benefit. All right. And there's something to that. Oh, right? I agree. Absolutely agree. He says the pe people overall give to vision. And I've often argued that, that money follows vision and mission. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, 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 you know, I, I don't deny that at all. Um, I think he's, you know, to a certain extent, he's right. I've often said there's, there's nothing exciting about giving to a budget. Hey, God, my brilliant! Mm -hmm. You know, there's just a th not, no thrill of that, you know. We're giving money to keep the doors open. Um, it, he seems to be critical, um, you know, that U.S. churches devote more than 85% of their spending on congregational finances to salaries, utility bills, and brick-and-mortar maintenance. Well, yes, every, any church, the single biggest um, expense of any church is always going to be their salaries. Mm -hmm. That's, that's just generally the single biggest item on anybody's, um, you know, thing, our salaries. I mean, you know, uh, uh, and benefits, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, as we all know, uh, you know, health insurance, you know, went up, it's going up anywhere between 10 to 10 to 30, 25, 30 percent for companies next year. It's going to be a huge hit. Yep. Ours is going up 10. Yeah. As we have uh, 26 year old children, unquote, coming on to being taken care of. <sighs> anyway, uh, we won't go on there anymore. Um, but I, I mean, so I, I mean, <laughs> but I think most churches, because people don't mind giving and seeing that kind of money spent. If the church is doing something, if the church is growing, if the church is trying for outreach, if the church is trying to be in mission, it's just when it's all just seems to be focused inward that there's just no excitement there. Right. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, um, I'm not going to get into numbers, but all right, we're repairing our roof. OK. All right. We didn't present it as well. OK. We kind of did as far as like, look, if you. Um, if you don't want to get wet during worship, you know, <laughs> we're going to need money to repair the roof. But, you know, one of the big things that we focus on is, look, we're starting a, a whole new big outreach program and things like that. We're really going to be reaching out into the community and, and, and sharing the gospel in the community and that. And you know what? When people come, this we're not just going to fix the roof. We're going to renovate the whole outside of the building, all right? 
we want to make this place look really attractive so that when people come, they're not going, oh, that really needs to be fixed. You know, we want right. to set a good impression. And so it's, it's very outreach focused. And people responded just overwhelmingly positive to that. Right. Uh, what, a couple months ago, I guess it's been now, um, we presented a new evangelism, um, campaign that, that we're going to start and, um, and said, we're going to need money to, to pull this off and, and we don't have enough in the budget. And people responded overwhelming and just, I mean, way beyond expectation. And, um, why? Because they went, this is so cool. This is great. Yeah. I want to support this. Right. This is, this is good stuff. Um, you know, and the other thing is, and I, I say, I, I don't know. Okay. Cause, cause they're saying, um, these church religious organizations, the increase, which includes World Vision and Salvation Army. Well, the reality is a lot of people give to World Vision and Salvation Army who are not necessarily Christian. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, you know, Salvation Army particularly, you know, um, I mean, I, if you even ask, if you went out and, and asked people, how many of you consider Salvation Army to be a religious organization? Yeah. Something tells me a lot of people would just kind of look Most at it. Most people don't. They have no idea of the fact that it's a denomination. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, it, it's actually a sect. Did you know that? Cause, yeah. Cause it's, well, it's actually a sect because they deny, um, the sacraments, and I think communion is bread and water or something like that within them. Well, yeah, um, and they also teach salvation apart from Christ, that you can be saved by good works, basically. Yeah. I mean, and, and World Vision, I've seen that, you know, advertised in, you know, Newsweek magazine. Mm-hmm. You know, so, I mean, I'm just really kind of questioning, you know, their judgment here. Because when you do some slick advertising and stuff, and, uh, you know, you reach, you know, beyond, uh, you know, congregations and beyond people. Uh, you know, they said, you know, the Salvation Army has, you know, a, uh, a red kettle, online red kettle. And an iPhone app. Yeah. You know, but, but I mean, for, you know, people to donate. Mm-hmm. You know, um, most churches, I'm not going to go out and ask for money from anybody outside my, my congregation. Right. So I, I love the, the subtitle, um, <laughs> the subtitle of the report. Kudos to Wycliffe Bible Translators and World Vision for global at scale goals. But will denominations resist Jesus Christ and not spend a dollar to tw- one to twenty six dollars per member to reach the unreached when Jesus says you feed them? <laughs> you bad people. Jesus said to take care of people, and you're not even supporting your churches, so you could do that. <laughs> well, again, I mean, it comes to the question of what can we be the best at? What are we passionate about? And what what and and, and what's our um, economic engine? How how do we, you know, come up with you know what what we're all about as a church? I mean, okay, <sighs> you know, well, we're located in Dedham. There is not the need for a soup kitchen. We cannot be the best church at doing that. We don't have the, you know. Now, what do we do? Well, we're doing 32, uh, at least, uh, I don't know how much more money we got today, but 32 holiday baskets. Now, that's huge. You know, that we are, we're getting together 32 baskets to give away uh, next weekend. Uh, you know, you, you, you <laughs> You know, uh, um, you know, and there, you know, so we, we collect, collected well over a thousand dollars for that. Uh, and we'll do it again next time. Plus we have a preschool. We can have one of the best preschools in our area. We do. And we're very proud of that. We have a fantastic vacation Bible school. You know, we are passionate about children's ministry and we can be very good at doing children's ministry. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, okay. That, it's, it, that doesn't make us a bad church because we're not interested because we're not you know out there feeding the hungry. Yeah, no, this that's like um, this is something that that I've really thought about is uh, that I'd really like our church to be a multi ethnic church, right? But North Ridgeville is like ninety something percent white. Guess what? Unless we're seriously pulling people in from 
some of the airy communities, but some of them are also pretty mostly white. Um, unless we're specifically targeting other area communities where there's other churches where, you know, really it would make more sense for people to go there. Um, we're not going to be a, a big time multi-ethnic church, you know? Right. I mean, so. our, no, no, it's, it's interesting because my neighbor, my, my, my town is very multi-ethnic. Dedham, where the church is located in that area is overwhelmingly white. It's 90 some percent too. So right, for for us to be a a a, a serious multi ethnic church, it's just not going to happen unless you're trying to pull people from seven to ten miles away. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, so and not, you know, and and that's not to say that you know that we don't welcome. I mean, we have people of other you know sort of non whites that are members and and regular active members um, of our church, but um, you know, wanting to. But at the same time, I I got a comment from somebody one time that said, you know what. Um, my, my kids are black and, um, there's no black people at the church and they just don't feel com They, they feel more comfortable at a church where there's more black people. I want to change that, but I, you know, there's nothing I can do. Not that they wouldn't be welcome here. Um, but if, if that's what they're looking for, we can't provide that. Not right, right. now, you know? And 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 I don't really see that changing unless the demographics of our community change quite a bit. Right. Um, but you know, I so I don't know. I just I just have a real, um, yeah. Um, they talked to some guy from Notre Dame, and he says the main reasons Christians hold back on their generosity are bad personal financial habits, distrust of where the money is going, and a lack of teaching from the pulpit. I don't know. I mean, in most local churches, I don't know people. I mean, most most local churches are small. Mm-hmm. You know, there's very few, very large ones. And I don't think there's a lot of distrust to where the money's going. I don't think that's, you know, a big issue. I do believe it's bad personal financial habits, and I do believe it's a lack of teaching about giving with the pulpit. Yeah. Right, right. You know, and there's a, up until fairly recently, I was pretty afraid of, of preaching about anything about personal giving. Um, and, and really I was, I was, you know, sort of convicted of the fact that the Bible talks about it all over the place. Um, and so for me to just completely avoid that, to avoid offending people, it was, uh, I forget who it was. Um, one of the church leadership guys I was listening to, he said, you know, um, pastors are afraid to, to preach about that because uh, they're afraid they're going to offend people. Well, the only people that are going to be offended by it are the people that um, that don't want to give. And you know, he said this. It's that's like saying, "Oh, I'm not going to preach about adultery because it's going to offend some people." Well, who's going to be offended by that? You know, uh, it's got right. a point. <laughs> well, my my favorite one, my favorite story, and again, I don't know if the guy's telling the truth or not. He's making it up. That was John Maxwell tells a story of a member coming to him and saying, Pastor, you know, I'm really not happy with what's going on around the church, and I've decided I'm going to withhold on my pledge, you know, until some things change. And he said, well, I, I understand you feel that way, and I'm sorry. He said, uh, why don't you come with me? The guy goes, oh, okay. He goes, come on. He goes, and he walks in the church, and he goes up to the altar to make me He says, okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to kneel here, and you're going to pray, and you're going to tell Jesus why you're withholding his money. <laughs> because you see you didn't make a pledge to the church you made a pledge to God so you're, you're going to tell God now what, what, what's what's going on and what you don't like and what needs to change and why you're withholding his money okay so and I'm, I'm not going to say anything I'm not going to say pray and, and have this conversation with God <laughs> you know, that's what it's all about you know it's just you know it's it really is helping people realize that but yeah people do have bad financial habits and what they realize a lot of times is that they can eat, they can tithe. I found that out myself. I can tithe, you know, but I have to change some of my financial habits to do that. Right. And, uh, yep. Did you the know, same thing. it's, didn't think you know, it was possible. Not, it was, have you been, did I really convince you to? Oh yeah. 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 A long oh, time ago. Really yeah. Oh, like, okay. uh, I don't you know, several months ago. Yeah. Okay, because I, I remember actually, having that conversation with you and challenged you to do it. I know, and I, and I was like, no way, there's no way, because things are so tight. And finally I said, you know what, forget it, you know, we're going to do it. And 
because I can't tell my people to unless I'm doing it. That's right. And which is another reason that a lot of pastors are afraid to. Um, well, that's exactly what I was afraid to because I wasn't tithing and I did not. And I've even told my people, I said, I, I, I wasn't tithing and I couldn't tell you to do it because the money counters with John's being a hypocrite. Mm-hmm. So, and, yeah. uh, no, I, I am, um, you know, and, uh, well, folks, born again tithers, we're scary people. We really am. You know, those of us who've, who've gone through it and learned, uh, and, and it's been part of our lives now for, for a long, for, well, part of my, for three, about four years, I think. And my daughter, when I was like, how much do you give the church each week? You know, just shocked. I'm like, yeah. I said, yeah, there's times it looks a little tough given, you know, all that money. But you know what? God, God makes sure we pay our bills, you know, and I'm taking, I, I, I already, they're setting budget this week. And, uh, I told him I'm, I want a salary freeze for another year, you know, uh, cause we're not quite making budget and, you know, we, we're doing better, we're doing very well, much better than last year. But, you know, I want a salary freeze for another year, you know, just until we can begin building again. So, I don't know. I just, I just wondered about the, the I, it seems to me this was a, 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 um, study that had a bias. Yeah. But just the, the subtitle. <laughs> yeah. You know, and so I don't know, man, not sure. I don't know. Maybe what people um, would give to, uh, you know, more bus ads by, let's say, considered humanism. <laughs> Any monkey business is ill-advised. Right. Last year we talked about the no God, no problem um, ads uh, by the, what was it, the American Humanist Association and the Diefel Free Thought Foundation. Right. As we discover, you know, the days grow shorter, the holidays approach, and the American Human Association throws out more anti-religious ads. Yep. Now, this year, of course, it's not only going beyond the, um, the, the the Bible. Now, this year, they're going after the Quran, too. So, hey, humanists, put pictures of Muhammad up there. <laughs> oh, okay. Just don't put pictures of Muhammad on the buses, though. That would be bad. No, but you could put it on your website. Put yeah. it on your website. Yep. Yep. See how well those uh, those people know what a um, denial of service attack is. Yeah. Anyway, it says, while the Bible may contain value, some valuable lessons, it has messages on hate on war. It teaches hate and religious bigotry. It presents values that are in line that uh, that are the antithesis of American self-reliance, individual reli- liberty, and equality before the law. I have no idea what that meant. Uh, takes on moral topics including women, slavery, war, homosexuality, and punishment by comparing verses of the Bible and the Quran with quotes from AHA or humanist figures. Yep, so... Uh, one ad on homosexuality juxtaposes scripture from Leviticus that calls the act of a man lying with another man detestable with an AHA resolution affirming sexual equality and the legalization of same-sex marriage. I don't think they're going to win a lot of converts there, given that more people are against same-sex marriage than are in favor of it. That seems like a sort of tenuous ad. Um, one video ad features the renowned atheist Richard Dawkins giving the humanist take on intelligence, responding to a Bible verse from Proverbs 3, 5, which calls on believers to trust in the Lord and lean not on their own understanding. Dawkins says belief should be supported by evidence and logic and not by tradition, authority, or revelation. I don't know. God talks me through a burning bush. I'm going to take his word for it. You know, tonight we were... uh, in our Genesis Bible class, we were looking at Genesis three and, and we read Genesis three fifteen and talked about what it was saying. And, and I mean, people at the Bible class were just going, wow. And that's all right there way back in Genesis, the whole, you know, the crucifixion and the virgin birth and, you know, it, it, it's all there and, and wow. And yeah, exactly. That's why I trust in the Lord. If he had that figured out, that far in advance, he's got my vote. <laughs> right. And, and here's the, 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 the thing. Uh, it's interesting that um, 
before I actually looked at Dale's email, Dale emails me on Saturday, Sunday what our store is going to be. I was reading about this uh, by an um, online column by Jeff Jacoby in the Boston Globe. Now, Jeff Jacoby is a is a um, libertarian Jew, uh, but a Orthodox Jew uh, up here in Boston. And he, he writes this. <clears throat> A society bereft of religious heritage is not one that even Speckhart, the head of the American Human Association, would want to live in. For in a world without God, there is no obvious difference between good and evil. There is no way to prove that murder is wrong. If there is no creator who decrees, thou shalt not murder. It certainly cannot be proved by reason alone. One might reason instead, as Lenin, Stalin, and Mao reasoned. There's nothing wrong with murdering human beings by the millions if doing so advances the Marxist cause. One might reason from observing nature that the way of the world is for the weak, strong to devour the weak, or that natural selection favors the survival of the fearest by any means necessary, including the killing of the less fit. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so I've got an atheist friend that always points to, I think it's Immanuel Kant that talked about the social contract. Um, you know, that you sort of, another way of saying it is, um, you know, the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Um, but the point being that, look, I'm going to treat you well in the hopes that you'll treat me well. So it's a sort of selfish version of the golden rule. Um, mm-hmm. All right. So the problem with that is that, okay, fine. Um, I'm rich and powerful. And so if you're rich and powerful, I'll treat you well. If you're not, I have no reason to. Right. right. Or, here's a... Go back to Jacoby Calvin here just a second. <clears throat> um, you know, we dr- we okay. drown even children who at birth weakly and abnormal, wrote the Roman philosopher Seneca the Younger 2,000 years ago, stressing that it is not anger but reason that justifies the murder of handicapped children. There you go. Mm-hmm. We're just helping them out, putting them out of their misery, right. giving them, you know, quality of life. They don't have quality of life, and right. so we should just kill them. Well, not to say that the quality of life is a completely wrong argument. I mean, you know, in, in dealing with some elderly and sometimes the question of, you know, how much uh, effort do you make in, in, in end-of-life issues, it can be a, 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 it can be a factor. Right to right. consider, um, you know that uh, okay, I mean, but but you know, shouldn't be the only one. But anyhow, uh, 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 so you know, there are the problem is, I mean, you know, he doesn't want to admit it, but you're at the best you're left with um, um, the law that's written on people's hearts. But he doesn't want to use that term. The problem with the law that's written on people's hearts is that our consciences will sometimes accuse us and other times defend us, says Paul. Um, Paul, in I think it's Timothy, talks about people whose conscience have been seared with a, with a hot iron. Mm-hmm. And, and they have, you know. Um, <laughs> I mean, if you look at his, uh, just the stuff that he's, you know, that, that goes on in the world. Uh, pornography, sex trafficking, um, Sexual abuse and other forms of abuse of children. Sure. Um, Look at that thing just you know, in uh, the the Amazon. Um, the the book that Amazon's been taking heat for selling the ebook right. on um, you know how to be a pedophile, basically. Um, you know, in in a world without uh, someone saying this is right, this is wrong, um, and having some sort of moral absolute, what's wrong with that? That's what these people are saying. I was born that way. That's right, my sexual it's... preference, All right? right? We draw the line there, and 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 um, uh, uh, and you can cherry pick the Bible, and you can cherry pick other books. Mm-hmm. But the fact of the matter is, if you want to play that game, you can easily cherry pick a lot of uh, humanist philosophers. Um, uh, if nothing else, you you can have a great time with Peter Singer down there in um, uh, 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 where was he at? Uh, yeah, Princeton. Princeton, yeah. I mean, man, you would have no trouble cherry picking some of his stuff, which I mean, it's utilitarianism. Mm-hmm. If you're if you're useful, fine. If you're not, hell with you. 
But you don't believe in hell. <laughs> so, but no, yeah, I know. no, no, absolutely. And and that's the thing is, even if you hold to this social contract idea, so what's to why should everybody else hold to your social contract? You know, it, what I, what's your what's your basis for that? What why is that better than any other system? So, or or another thing is uh, one of the vid ads. As a pastor citing First Corinthians two, First Timothy two twelve, I do not allow women to teach or have authority over a man. She must be silent. Um, and then contrast that with the nineteenth century free thinker Robert Ingersoll stating the rights of men and women should be equal and sacred, and that marriage is a perfect partnership. Well, number one, he's completely taking the, te- the Timothy quote out of out of context. Mm-hmm. He's not talking about marriage. He didn't even finish the sentence. Uh, it's, it remains well, silent true. in the church, in the right. assembly. You know, he's only talking about in, within the church. And there's a debate as to what, I mean, okay, first off, there is a, there is a debate as whether or not Paul even wrote the words. Okay. That we have to, have to, you know, admit that. I think it's, I think it's authentic by Paul, but there is some debate, um, about that. But it is dealing with what's going on in the church. And the remarkable thing, of course, is starting out then is, is where Paul says that women should, should learn in silence. Well, the, the, the remarkable thing is that a Pharisee is saying women should learn Torah. You know, the idea of women learning Torah was not, you know, common among most rabbis. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. That Paul was a rabbi. He's saying women should learn. Um, <laughs> Wait, women should learn. And how? In silence. Well, how did the men learn? Oh, they learned by talking all the time while, they, while Jesus was up there talking. The disciples never paid any attention to him. No, they learned in silence. Just like any other student, uh, any other teacher likes their students to learn. I mean, I'll tell you what, yeah, I mean, you still have kids in school. Go to your school tomorrow and say, do you want the kids to be noisy and talking or do you want them to be quiet while you're teaching? I bet she's going to say children should learn in silence. <laughs> Tell her she's anti-children because she believes that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And and because they are being taught, ask her who should have the authority in this classroom. You are the kids. <laughs> she is anti-children. Yeah. I mean, reality is you can believe that marriage is a, uh, a, a, a partnership and you can believe that the rights of men and women should be equal and sacred. At the same time, believing, um, you know, maybe disbelieve, may, may, as you and I do, not believe that women should necessarily be ordained. But yet, you know, uphold that marriage is a, a partnership. Uh, and that, if anything, God calls us to, to give for one another entirely out of Christ. You know, every, every atheist that I've ever talked to, um, and this is a understanding, this is a small sample, okay? not necessarily representative, but every atheist that I've ever talked to and presented a truly biblical view of, of, um, of, of marriage and, and the, the sort the self-sacrifice that is, that the Bible is calling for, they went, Whoa, I'm not going to give like that to my wife. That, I mean, you're asking too much there. What about my needs? What about my my dreams and goals and, and all that kind of stuff? You're asking me if if called upon if if that's my my wife's need to um to set aside that for her, like if that's what's necessary, yeah, your marriage comes first, all right? Now the people, you know, I was listening to a, a small business uh, podcast one time, and the guy was talking about how um, he was ready to take his business to the next level, and his wife didn't think it was a good idea. And, um, and so he divorced her and, and that was his recommendation. And we went, <laughs> we were, we were in the car. Like it was like, I don't know, Christmas or something like that. We were, or we were driving back home from visiting family. So my wife's sitting there listening to this with me. <laughs> and she's just like, what? <laughs> like, I had no idea he was going this way. This is not what they normally talk about on here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, and uh, I stopped listening to it, but uh, it was just crazy. But, but 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 think about that. Why not? Right. Yeah. And I mean, if if humanism is right, why not? Why why should I care about what this other person? This, this other person is impeding me, my hopes, my dreams, my goals, my plans for my future. 
Why should I let this other person get in my way? Right. And, and you know, and the thing is, that's what I hear from, you know, from my atheist friends. Right. This is a completely different worldview that we're espousing here. You know, but you can't and, and you can say that you disagree with that worldview and, and that you think that it's asking too much. But you certainly can't say that we're putting down women when we are saying that we need to uphold them and, and you know, and give up our lives for them. And, yeah. oh, I like women. I married one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> you know, I mean, um, you know, it, 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 it's a, uh, you know, but yeah, there is a, a, but our view is based on what does God say? What does God call us to do? Yeah. And what has and, God already uh, done for us? Right. And, you know, the, you know, uh, um, and though they don't want to admit it, people like Speckhart and Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant and his idea of a social contract, you know, to a certain extent, he had a Christian, or I guess we'd even say Judeo Christian, uh, um, you know, worldview to base things on, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, that was the, the, the givenness of, you know, Kant's world. It was, well, that broad thing that we call Christendom. Yeah. Yeah. See how that works in the Muslim world? Um, you know, where, uh, yeah, uh, as long as you, um, hold to Islam, then, uh, then I'll respect you. And if I leave Islam, I expect you to, to kill me. And if, um, and if you leave Islam, I expect to kill you. <laughs> you know, social contract. In that case, I shall have to kill you. I want to close my comments on this with by Jeff Jacoby. I think he just writes a very reasoned article. Reason is not enough. Only if there is a God who forbids murder is murder definitively evil. Otherwise, its wrongfulness is a matter of opinion. Mao and Seneca approve of murder. We disapprove. What makes us think we're right? The God who created us created us to be good. Atheists may believe and spend a small fortune advertising that we can all be good without God. History tells us a very different story. Mm -hmm. Are you incapable yeah. of restraining yourself, or do you take pride in being an insufferable know-it-all? You know, and I think what it comes down to is that we are, um, we, or we strive to be good because of the goodness that God has shown to us, that he sent his son Jesus to pay for our sins. He gave up his life for us and so that we can in turn um, give up our lives for others, knowing that we're not really giving up anything. We're just celebrating his love. Hey, buddy, I'm not paying you to hear your thoughts on life. Absolutely. So, and there goes our audio. Good timing. So, um, <laughs> so with that, um, do we have any additional comments besides the shirt? All right. My shirt, my shirt, man. May I have one more one more that that uh, give my uh, address? I'd rather make a comment. Comment. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um. So, any comments? Yeah, we talked about some pretty controversial stuff. If if you, uh, I, I'd, I'd love to hear people's opinions on where's that line as far as what's tacky and and what is just little hero worship of Jesus uh, when it comes to all this sort of Jesus junk or whatever you want to call it. Um. You know, what do, what do you think about the, the, um, the, uh, donations story or, um, churches with, with electric, uh, uh, charging stations? Um, you know, we'd l really like to, to hear from you. All right. If you're watching this on YouTube or one of the social, uh, websites, you can just post a comment right there or you can send us, uh, feedback at podcast at crossfeednews.com. Or if you got a comment on what you think of my shirt. <laughs> oh, the audio comes back for that. <laughs> yeah. Hey, take care, everybody. Later. God bless. All right. Good night, everybody. God bless.